Yeah, so I mean, we've discussed a bit this technocratic logic, you know, this idea that there could be a single um, solution, you know, a market apparatus. You establish uh, an, a, a commodity, the absence of one ton of greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide equivalent. And then you build a market apparatus with, you know, there's a target, there's caps, so industry only have a certain amount of permits that they can, or a certain number of emissions they can emit yearly, and then they have to reduce below that cap. So that creates actually a value or an instrument, a sort of commodity. And you could think that that system would apply then to any context, to any situation. If it, you can design uh, the, the European Union emissions trading system, you can then pick up that legal framework and maybe even the institutional apparatus, transfer it to Japan, and then see the same sort of function in that different cultural context. And what I explore in the book is the fact that it doesn't neatly work that way. You can't just transmit a universal solution with respect to climate change. It's not to say there's not an appeal to markets. I think they are incredibly appealing. And if anything, we've seen you know, in the last few years more than 45 um, emissions trading systems established across the world, not just in developed countries, but now increasingly in developing countries as well. So there's an appeal to the logic but the form in which the markets, or the form the markets take, and the way in which they operates, operate differs between states. And I think that understanding why it differs and how those differences come to be is really important. So that's where, you know, again, this idea of technocratic or universal solutions confronts the, the local realities, the socio-political context in which the markets are built. And so one of the things I explore in the book is you know, the logics of climate policies or the logics through which climate policies are constructed by policymakers. And what's really interesting in the United States is this drive towards security. So you can think about how climate change as an issue is framed. And you see in other countries, you know, in Europe, there's a big push towards economic opportunity, towards issues maybe even of aid or obligation um, to less fortunate countries. In Australia, there was a big push towards morality, you know, the doing your fair share and being an active global citizen and, and why Australians should respond to climate change. And what's interesting in the United States, which is a very diverse country um, with a range of different interests that are affected by climate change, there's been so much polarization and dispute over the issue. It's become a very heated political issue and it's taken on a range of different value connotations. It's interesting because a lot of people, they don't talk about, is climate change real? They say, do you believe in climate change? So it's not a matter of rational scientific assessment, it's a matter of faith or belief. And any issue that takes on that sort of value-laden context becomes very difficult to move through an active democracy like the United States because any stakeholder can really, and, and when you think about multiple stakeholders who have different interests or different perspectives on climate change, they can stop the policy process. And this is what we've seen time and time again at the federal level.